So, we are going to pick up on slide four is where we finished off. Um, so, we this whole unit is basically talking about plate tectonics and the idea that these giant chunks of, of Earth are floating on the asthenosphere. All right, and so I said yesterday, think of the asthenosphere like the, it's the magma. So it's like a pool of magma, which if you can picture lava coming out of a volcano, that's what magma is when it's inside the Earth. And then you have these giant plates. Think of those as like a raft floating on that, right? And so the plates involve the top portion of the mantle and the crust, whether it's oceanic or continental. So that's what we call the lithosphere, right? When you have the top portion of the mantle and then whatever crust is over it. So the lithosphere are the plates and they float in the asthenosphere. What else is found in the asthenosphere? What major event is taking place all the time? Convection currents. There's convection currents, right? And so we know that they are moving because they get heated up and then they become more dense, or excuse me, less dense, and then they rise and then they cool and then they get more dense as they cool and then they sink again. So that process is going to be a huge part of this. Okay. So we're trying to prove that plate tectonics is real. Like we're looking at, it's called the theory of plate tectonics. And so there's evidence that proves, you know what? This isn't a real thing. It's not just something made up because it kind of sounds like science fiction, right? Like you have these giant plates and then the earth inside is so hot that it's causing these currents that move the plates and that our continent all used to be one giant continent instead of, you know, broken up into our seven continents that we have now. Like that all sounds pretty wild, right? So we're going to look at evidence that's going to show what's really going on and is this a real thing or is it kind of fake, right? So there's going to actually be four pieces of evidence that support this, all right? And so this is where we left off yesterday, talking about the first one, right? This idea that the continents have drifted. They do exactly what the name says they do. They've drifted apart. Um, Braden had a good observation just looking at the vocab. He's like, hey, isn't there a song? Well, there's a movie from, it's one of the Ice Age movies, right? Continental Drift. Um, so with Manny and... Um, Sid. Sid. Oh, sheesh. Um, and we do have um, a couple of different songs this unit, and I know that'll be one of them. Um, so we'll take a look at that. But if you think about that movie, it actually kind of shows that. If you remember watching that, um, it shows like the instant that the continent started to split apart and drift. Yeah. So um, if you haven't seen it, and you might want to watch it, it's pretty good. So continental drift is the first piece of evidence that plate tectonics are legit, like it really happened, all right? So here's some things that kind of support the idea that continental drift happened, all right? So continent, the continents kind of fit like a puzzle piece. And we'll do a couple activities that will help kind of, you'll see how if you shift things just a little bit, the continents look like they um, used to be together, okay? And so this is talking about the idea um, that if they used to be together, then at some point that, you know, in these last 300 million years or so, they have kind of started to spread apart to their current locations. And that's what continental drift is. Again, it does exactly what the name says it's going to do. Yes? What happens when they keep on moving and going to another one? Like, what happens when they run into each other? Well, I mean, we'll look at what happens when um, land masses collide. So, so hold that thought. It could, yeah. It could. If one's more dense than the other. Yep, you're, you're right on the right track. All right, so in the video uh, that we watched yesterday, it said that Alfred Wenger, and you'll hear his name pronounced a little bit different, um, he was German. Um, Wegener, Wagner, you'll hear a couple different ways. Um, I just call him Alfred usually. He was the one that was like, hey, these continents really seem like they used to be together. And people were like, you're crazy. How can continents move? There's no way. You're psycho. And they basically laughed him out of the scientific community. So all these years later, we got some more information and started realizing, oh my gosh, he had it right. He just didn't have the proof. He didn't have the evidence. Um, but he's the one that came up with this first idea, right? The, the idea that the continents all used to be together in one giant landmass and that landmass is called Pangea. 
Notice how this one has the A, the one on the slide yesterday didn't have the extra A in there. Again, you'll see it both ways, so I kind of want to show it to you both ways so you're not thinking it's something different. Again, it's a really weird word, no matter how you spell it. Uh, but Pangea meaning all land, which makes sense if all the land was together, that you would call that Pangea, if that's what Pangea means, is all land. So now we know that there's big oceans in between. And again, this was super controversial. So we, we've talked about this, and we'll talk about it more this year, that we have the benefit of what's already been discovered in the past. We can look at this and be like, well, duh, of course he was right. We have all this evidence that has been proven since then. We have that benefit. They didn't have it. They were living in it. Hopefully in like, you know, 40, 50 years, maybe hopefully not even that long, you know, young people will be like, I can't believe they didn't have a cure for cancer. Like, how stupid is that? We've got a cure. Like, how is it that they didn't have that? So when, when something hasn't been understood or hasn't been discovered, in the moment it's like, whoa, this is really hard, this is weird, this is difficult. When you're in the future looking back, then people are like, duh, like, this makes so much sense, or this was so easy, what took them so long to figure it out? So you just kind of have to look at it like that. We know about gravity. We know that the Earth is round. We have all these benefits because of all the people who have come before us. They didn't. Like, they were living in the moment and not understanding all the stuff that we understand now because it hadn't been discovered yet or understood yet. So just kind of keep that in mind. Like, sometimes, you know, like, okay, think about it like this. We didn't have cell phones when I was in school. I didn't have a cell phone until I was, like, 20, 21 years old, and it was not like the cell phones you're thinking of. Right? You guys can't imagine life without a cell phone. Who here even has a house phone? Okay, a couple of you, right? That's all we had, right? That was it. It was, you know, like it was no big deal. Like we were fine. Like we didn't know what we were missing. It hadn't, it wasn't out there yet. So we didn't even know, right? So if you think of things like that with technology, you know, that's kind of how it is with the scientific field also. You don't really even know until it's been discovered or invented and you're taking advantage of it. And then be like, well, how did you survive without it? Or how did they not know this? All right, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go through some of this. So it was very controversial. It wasn't until after he died that he was kind of validated and people were like, oh, wow, he was right. Um, and then I, people kind of felt bad because they, like I said, they laughed at him. They're like, you're crazy. And they basically kind of were like, you, you know, you don't even make sense. Like, how can we take anything you say serious when you're coming up with all these crazy ideas? All right, so this is kind of a reconstruction. MY means millions of years ago. So you can see Pangea, and then you can see it now. So there's Pangea. You can see how they're saying the continents kind of separated. And you see the red, right? That's kind of showing um, not necessarily the plates that the continents are resting on, but it's kind of showing those boundaries a little bit. Okay, so there's a lot of different things. You guys have any ideas where or how scientists figured out that this is actually happening? Any thoughts at all? Like, what, what could have led them to realize this is what we used to be like? What do you think? They could feel the way we're excited to. Okay, so if they discovered that there's the asthenosphere and that it has those convection currents, that that could cause movement, definitely that could help. Maybe there's like marks in the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so like markings of maybe like stone or rock or something matching up or something? Yeah. Okay, good. Something matching up or lining up? Yep. The Marianas Trench. Okay, so like how did that form? Like the plates could have separated. Okay, so there's some features underneath the ocean floor that, that is the ocean floor um, that it's like how do you explain mountain ranges there? How do you explain these big huge trenches there? Good. Something had to be going on. Yeah. Uh, I, was no. gonna, I was gonna say something, but never mind. Okay. All right. Good. Those are good thoughts. We'll see how close you come. Okay. So we are proving the Alfred now. So we're in the process of proving plate tectonics. The first evidence is continental drift. But because continental drift is so controversial, we also have pieces of evidence that are going to prove that continental drift is for real and that Alfred was actually correct. So here's the first piece of evidence that there are similar type fossils found in locations and they're the only places those things are found, but now they're separated by an ocean. 
logically that doesn't make sense. Like if you have something, you would think that like it would have been together, all right? So there's fossils of this um, prehistoric kind of like crocodile, alligator type thing called the Menosaurus. And you can see it's found in South Africa and, or excuse me, South America and, and in Africa. And you see, you know, the eastern coast matching up with the western coast here. These animals live in fresh water. They can't swim across a salty ocean. So if the continents are in the position that they are now, how did they get across? Do you have a question or a comment? Can they live in Florida? Well, it's not showing us Florida, and these are, it's, it's, they're not crocodiles or alligators. They're just like ancestors. I said they're like, I mean, if you look at them, right, you can see they look like crocodiles and alligators. Okay, so they're, they're, they're related. They're somehow ancestors, but these are much, much older. Okay, so you can't swim across the salty ocean. How'd they get there? It's magic. Magic? magic. Like, Teleportation? Teleportation. They can figure it out, and we can figure it out. They brought them across. Who brought them across? People. The alien, they took a boat. <laughs> Okay, so what if they're older than known man? They have the the, the cavemans took them. They could have started out both continents. Okay, so I mean, can't say that maybe they didn't. But what people, what they started to figure out is that well, maybe the reptiles lived on both continents um, when they were joined together as Pangaea. And then as they separated, some stayed with um, South America and st some stayed with Africa. And then as the continents just kept spreading apart more and more and more, then they ended up being separated. Yes? But what if they were just both there like all the time? Like what if they would stay different and separate? What if they just started? Like they both Why are both people well, I guess I don't really follow. Like if these were together, like it makes sense that some could have stayed here and some could have stayed here. But if they were always separate, why do you, that's the only place you have them, is right where those, they would have lined up if they had been together. That's it what it is. It looks like it's like a cousin. It does, right? And that's one of the things we'll talk about. Okay? That is definitely one we'll talk about. So they basically kind of think, well, there's not like a big bridge that connects them. They could just walk back and forth. They can't swim. There were no planes or anything. So one of the logical conclusions is that those continents maybe used to be together, right? Obviously they aren't now, but something had to be that way. So we have fossils. That's one piece of evidence for continental drift. The other piece is similar climates, okay? So there are tropical plants that are found in areas that are considered Arctic or frozen. Do palm trees exist at the North Pole? Like, is that where they're naturally going to be found? No. Not in today's climate, right? A, a palm tree needs those warm, temperate climates. They can't survive in the Arctic or, you know, in that, that cold, snowy environment. No way. Doesn't make sense, right? There's no possible way that they grew where it was that cold and that they lived where it was that cold. Okay. Oops. Same thing with glaciers. We know glaciers are where things are cold. There are glacier evidences, just like we talked about, with eskers and striations and more rains and erratics. Lots of glacial evidence in places that are tropical, at the equator. You can't have a glacier at the equator, not for it to, you know, be there any amount of time and leave like glacial evidence. Like, it would melt very quickly. Even if it's very big, the equator has the most intense sun <coughs> in the entire Earth because... That's where the, you know, it's the most concentrated. So no way that you have glaciers where it's that warm now, and no way that you have tropical plants where it's that cold now. But it makes sense if you look here, right? If you look here where there's glaciers, look how this spreads apart. So if there's glaciers that used to be here, and now you see some glacial evidence right here, if things moved, it would take that glacial evidence with it. Not that the glaciers existed where it is now kind of at that equator area, but that there used to be glaciers where it had formed when it was still Pangaea. Okay, so if it formed while it was still together and then moved, 
you're going to get those glacial evidences that move along with it. Same thing with the tropical plants, right? So it used to be tropical and then things shifted and now it's, you know, in that Arctic region, okay? So fossils that can only be explained if the continents were get together, climate things that can only be explained if the, pla or the planets, the continents were together. And so obviously the evidence is showing that the climates must have been much different in the past. In the location that they had been previously, it was basically the complete opposite type climate, so that's why you have complete opposite type evidences of the plants and the, the glaciers that used to be there. And then finally, this one's really, really hard to, um, um, I guess, argue. It says the continents that were once joined together have really similar rock types, and they probably were once connected. Yes? So you're telling me that Ohio used to be like Florida? One time. Um, if you're looking, yeah, like if you look to see, like we have shifted. We shifted northern, right? For sure. About 300 million years ago. All right. So the Appalachian Mountains, which a lot of you have probably driven through or been to at some point, um, are part of the eastern United States. We see them right here in red. And they are very distinct in their age and the specific type of rock that are part of that mountain range. Okay? There is a strip of similar age and rock type here and here, okay, in Western Europe. If you put this back together as Pangea, look at this perfect mountain range that forms. And that is basically the entire North American continent long. It's a huge mountain range, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles long. All the same age rock, all the same type of rock. So if you took a piece from here and here, you wouldn't really be able to tell any difference at all. That's pretty dramatic, right? So if you had a mountain range that formed here, and then as Pangea started to separate, it separated that mountain, it's pretty hard to argue with. So we have similar fossils found in, in different continents. We have um, climates, right, the, the climate evidence. And now we have rock evidence that's showing, these things did not form separately. They didn't form three individual mountain ranges that all have the exact same age and exact same rock type and composition separately, right? That's harder to believe than the idea that Pangea was all together. Right, so those are three of our major evidences. Um, and, and obviously there's also a lot of other examples, uh, but the mountain range is pretty, the most dramatic of them. But there are a lot of similar kind of unique rocks for just South America and Africa that aren't found <coughs> anywhere else either. But personally, I think the mountains are the most extreme example. And then finally, like Braden said, he's like, seriously, the, they look like they fit together like a puzzle, right? So if you look here, and it will start to move to what we know now. It's not perfect, but it's pretty daggone close, okay? So the similarities of coastlines on opposite sides of the um, South Atlantic Ocean, um, even how, you know, other continents, but it's really dramatic with Africa and South America shore. We know that erosion is taking place at the coastlines and the shores, so it's not that the exact coastlines themselves match up, but it's the plates that the continents are resting on, and we can't see that. That's below the surface, right? That's upper mantle and our, our continental and oceanic crust, so we can see what's above the water, obviously, right? But we can't see you know, with just our normal eyes, like what's below. So maps and things are gonna show kind of the more visual, um, but underneath the plates even match up really, really good. It's like taking a hard boiled egg, and if you crack the egg, right, the pieces all fit together, right? Even though it's cracked, the eggshell fits together, okay? And so that's kind of like the plates, they're cracked, and so they're floating on top of that asthenosphere, 
and then the continents are resting on basically on top of that, or included with that plate, I guess. Okay. And so all the continents, when they were together, there must have been one huge ocean surrounding it. So almost like this giant island is what Pangaea was. Now obviously, you know, it's not totally sealed and connected, but that's kind of the general idea. You know, all the land is together, the rest of the globe is ocean. Okay. So there's Pangaea. And then we see the general slow, slow movement to get where we are today. Okay. So, yes? How do we, how do we get it? How does Antarctica connect to it if the continents are connected? So we'll look at a lot of different kind of diagrams. We don't know like exactly the way Pangaea. We're assuming just based on, you know, the way that things have been kind of reconstructed. Um, but you're saying like, so Antarctica you have, so it kind of just spreads out. And it's, it's hard because we're looking at, you know, like the earth is three dimensional. And then we are trying to put it one dimensionally as a map. So it doesn't make it exactly perfect. Like everything would have to be kind of spread out three dimensionally, but that's hard to see. So a lot of times it'll be spread out to look like this type of map, right? So really Antarctica kind of spreads out along the bottom, if that kind of helps a little. Yes? So in a million years, the globes today could be wrong? Yes. That's pretty crazy. So a million years, years is a long time. Well, but think this process was like three hundred million. Well, what about a hundred million? Years? Sure. I mean, it definitely. I mean, there's no reason as long as the convection currents keep going, because there's still internal heat inside the core. That there's no reason why the process shouldn't stop. So the U.S. could be like the next Antarctica. The next Antarctica could be like, like us. Yeah. Could be. I don't want to Could be. That's crazy. Don't worry, you'll be gone. <laughs> uh, we all will. So. Yeah, you're mine. Okay. So we're going to do a graphic organizer here in next week sometime, I think it is, to keep all these evidences straight because it can get a little confusing. Mm -hmm. But there's four pieces of evidence for plate tectonics, and there's four pieces of evidence that prove continental drift. So continental drift is the first piece of evidence for plate tectonics. But then continental drift itself has four. It has the rock types, it has the climates, it has the fossils, and then it has the puzzle-like fit. All four of those things go to back up Alfred's um, theory that the continents drifted, okay? And so those four things are what we just covered. Now we're gonna jump back to the second piece of the evidence for plate tectonics, and that is this idea called convection currents. Oh, we know about convection currents, so this is a good one to to move on to. So it was actually Sir Arthur Holmes who was the first geologist that came up with understanding that the plates are moving and kind of what's causing them to move, right? Um, so I don't need you to know these scientists, scientists' names. Um, just realize that you know they played an important part, obviously, in our understanding of what's going on beneath us here. So Holmes discovered that the Earth plates move because of what's going on inside the Earth. We have the hot core. The hot core is going to heat up this mantle, that stenosphere area of the mantle, okay, causing those convection currents to, to move, or, or allowing those currents to move, I guess. Right, so the idea that the convection currents take place in the stenosphere is still an important idea that you need for this unit. The asthenosphere has the convection currents, and that's the magma, and that is what the plates are sitting on, so then the plates are able to move. And again, think of that heating, rising, cooling, sinking process. Heating up just like you do if you're close to the bonfire. Hot things become less dense and rise. As you move away from the heat, just like if you move away from the bonfire, you cool down. And so then, um, as things cool down, they become more dense because the molecules come back together. More dense things will sink. As it sinks, voila, now it's back by the heat source and it's going to get warmed up again. So heating, rising, cooling, sinking. 
Okay? That process is what is so important. And so think back to our talks for the density and stuff last unit um, for that explanation. Is that something wrong? Oh, no. She's got it. Don't worry. And so remember, the less dense material rises as it's heated, the more dense material is going to sink as it cools. And so that rising and sinking, rising, sinking, heating, cooling, right? All of that perpetuates the system over and over again. And so energy from these convection currents comes from the core. So this is just a little, um, you can see here's our core, and you have all these cells, these convection cells, all throughout the asthenosphere in the mantle. Okay, so obviously the red arrows are hot, the blue are cooling off, and then you see them sinking. So just reinforcing that idea. And this one I think is kind of cool because it looks a little bit more realistic, not quite so cartoonish. Core, there we have, yeah, look how, like, it's really pretty violent and strong and intense, right? A little bit more realistic instead of just like, ooh, little arrows, right? That, that looks very violent. Right? And we're actually going to talk about what's going to happen there um, when it kind of comes through the crust. Um, some really cool things can happen, yeah. What happens when it is in the middle of the convection? What do you mean? Like up of, here or down here? Like in the middle of it, like the little like eye things. And right? Like, and like from like the, where it's circling. Uh, like oh, the, like here? No. Like, Just come show me. Here? Here? Like here. Oh, in the middle. Yeah. Well, that's still magma, but it's not in the current. So it's just kind of hanging out it's there. Like the ocean floor. It's the exact ocean. same thing. Wow. Oh. must not have been here that day. I wasn't. Was Ooh, it one day? So much stuff we missed. I'm guessing probably wasn't my night. Um, this one, actually, it kind of fits. We're gonna talk about what happens. See, this is showing kind of the plate moving. And I'll have this again. Um, so as the plate moves because of the convection cells, sometimes volcanoes will, will um, happen. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, come back to that one. Come on. All right, so I'm glad you guys, I like your reaction to that one because when I saw that, I was like, ooh, that's, well, I was gonna say cool, but it's kind of hot, right? It's neat. Um, seeing that. Okay, so we have two pieces we've talked about for plate tectonics for evidence. Continental drift and convection currents. Here's the third one. We're going to introduce this idea of sea floor spreading. It does exactly what it says. The sea floor is going to spread, right? So if you, the plates are on top of the currents and the currents are pulling them in opposite direction and it's sea floor, it's going to spread apart. Okay, so you can kind of see that here. Um, you can see the convection currents would be down here. It's pulling the the plates apart, and you get this sea floor that is spreading apart. Okay, and so when you get that hot, less dense material um, that is right there below the Earth's crust, it's going to rise towards the surface at these things called ridges. And it's going to flow sideways. And as it flows sideways, it's going to carry that seafloor away from this ridge in both directions. You can see it pulling equally. So it's being split here, and it's pulling, 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 and separating equally on either side of that split. And it was Harry Hess and Robert Dietz that coined the expression seafloor spreading which is really nice of them because it's easy, right? You can picture the seafloor spreading when you hear that name, right? And so as the seafloor spreads apart, the magma that's in the asthenosphere is now free to come up to the, to the surface, right? Up to where that, that crack or that opening is. But the ocean is very, very cold at the bottom. So as soon as that magma gets there, it cools and hardens and becomes new crust. Oh. Oh. Like a new, like, continent, like a little island? It's not, well, sometimes it can. We'll hold that thought. Um, 
I didn't even hear him. I didn't even hear him say anything. Hey, stop. Go. Just stop. Okay. Um. So we're gonna talk about this because a lot of things actually can happen because of it. All right. So hold that thought. Um. So the ocean floor is definitely not hot. So this is or not flat. Oh, sorry. So if we're looking here, right? This is our magma. If the sea floor is spreading, the magma can come up. And then as it reaches the, the bottom of the ocean, it's cold, right? You have this hot magma and it's cold. It cools off very quickly form and harden and forms new ocean floor that's going to spread and spread and spread, okay? And so this happens at what we're going to call divergent plate boundaries that we'll talk about later. Um, new crust spreads apart and the magma builds up and sometimes it can even form a mid-ocean ridge because all that kind of like accumulates in one spot and a special one is called um, the mid-atlantic ridge separating the north american continent from africa okay and so we get these mid-ocean ridges that form in the middle of the ocean because this is happening at the sea floor and so we'll put all of this together like i know i threw a lot of information um, we will take a look kind of more in depth about what this really looks like and prepare tomorrow. See you guys, so, by the bell.